Well, hey everybody, this is Maggie Moore, the online campus pastor here at Emmanuel Church. And I just wanna say welcome and thank you so much for joining us for our online experience today. Our mission here at Emmanuel is to engage everyone everywhere. And one of the greatest ways that you can help us with that is by participating in the online chat today. We have eChurch volunteers who are ready to pray for you, ready to talk with you, and ready to connect with you and learn how we can best serve you during today's experience. Again, I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great experience. Uh, Darren Scott, Deputy Fire Chief of the Salisbury Fire Department. Uh, it's kind of a family tradition. My dad and my uncles, my brother and my son, um, so I joined right out of high school in 1985. Actually, I had my anniversary yesterday, 37 years. I also served in Del Mar Fire Department for 20 years when I, was, when I lived in Del Mar. We have a lot of tours come in with kids, and, and that's, that's the best part. You know, if you can get them young, we have a cadet program. We try to get them in. We have a contest every year at all the elementary schools in Salisbury where they read books, and the, the child that reads the most books gets a backpack, uh, gets a ride to school on the fire engine. We also have what we call a chief of the day. We have a school locally that it is the biggest fundraiser that they have. And what happens is the child gets to come in, sits in the fire chief's desk, and gets his pictures taken. Then we take him or her to school, sirens and, and everything going. And uh, so it's, it's amazing. We've been doing it now probably 10 years, and they tell us it's the biggest one. It's just hard to believe, but it happens. And uh, but it's, it's great. When you can help someone who's at their worst, there, there's a lot of reward of that. Um, we have had people that have, we've pulled from burning homes and have lived and have come back to thank us. Um, ambulances where they've done CPR on someone and we've saved them and they come back and, and they come back and appreciate us, bring us donuts or lunch or whatever. I'll go to lunch sometimes and um, someone has picked up my tab. And you know, it's very appreciative, not necessary, but you know, they're just showing that they care. It, it was really big after 9-11. Very, very sketchy details reaching us here at Sky Center. Right now we're getting information, Al, that it was a small commuter plane. We believe that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. During the events of 9-11, I was actually working. We had just finished training and um, our dispatcher had his TV on and he says, oh my Lord, there's been a plane that's hit one of the towers. So as we all, of course, go running into his little room, which is not big enough for one person, much less four or five of us, uh, we watched the second plane go into the second tower. So immediately there was a uh, an office slash chief meeting going on upstairs. So we went upstairs to the chief at the time, and he immediately summoned us to call in extra help um, to prevent hopefully nothing from happening around this area. Uh, a lot of things have changed for us and around the around the country. Um, it's it's. Unfortunately, you got to keep watching your back and each other's back in today's society. The way people are, are shooting up things, and um, it's not just grocery stores and schools, it's police officers and firemen. We have to be on top of our game. Uh, we have to be our best when people are at their worst. It, it is a heavy burden uh, when you see people that are injured or unfortunately pass away. Um, we, we just actually had that last week with a fatal fire. So. You'll, you'll see us outside scenes, you know, we'll kid and carry on with one another. That's, that's how we try to forget about what's happened, but you never forget about it. It's always in your mind. Um, you know, we have members that go to therapy um, on a weekly basis, and it's needed. Can't save everybody, unfortunately, you know, because God has a different plan for them. I, I wouldn't change what I've done over the last 37 years for nothing. When you, when you wake up in the morning and want to come to work, that says a lot, and that's me. It's, I love it. I love this job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, good morning, church. Are you glad to be in church today? Welcome this morning. If you're here in person, would you please help me in welcoming, uh, welcoming our online church, our Chrisfield campus, those watching in Bethany. Would you let them know how much we appreciate them? Welcome, everyone. And today is a special day. As you see, today we commemorate and we remember 9-11. How many by a show of hands remember where you were by not, at 9-11 when the tower struck? You see all those hands? 
Uh, that is a moment that is uh, forever uh, in our hearts and in our minds where we just go back to the place where we saw it or we heard it and we all surrounded ourselves around the TV to see what would happen next. We didn't know what the future held, um, but at the same time, we know who held the future. Amen? And so today, we remember 9-11. We remember those who gave their, their life, the first responders. We remember those who lost their life by such a senseless tragedy. But today, we want to just honor our first responders on 9-11. There are so many who every day put on a uniform going to work not knowing if they're going to come home in the evenings and today we want to say on behalf of the church on behalf of the community we want to say thank you amen now before we do that this is what i'd like to do before we do that i would have you sit and then and then have them stand but you know if you know a first responder you know how they don't like drawing attention on themselves they're very selfless they would rather just uh, they, they would tell you a lot of them I'm just doing my job but how many know that it's more than just the job with what they do amen so for those of you that are here watching online if you're a first responder um, and you're here today we honor you we love you we appreciate you and we want to make sure we do our best to tell you that uh, what you do matters on a daily basis amen so on the count of three, this is what I want you to do. If you're a first responder here, I want you to just listen and look around you. On the count of three, would you just uh, give them a big ovation to show your appreciation and thanks? Can we do that today? One, two, three. Come on, let's hear from them today. Come on, thank you. We appreciate you. We love you. We remember you not only today, but every day for everything that you do. Come on, let's hear it for them today. Every first responder, we are so grateful for you on this line of Devin. Today, as we continue on with our series, let's remain standing for God's word. It's only appropriate that I preach from Galatians chapter 6. You'll see why here in a second is very fitting for 9-11. As we continue on with our series, Count Me In. Have you enjoyed the last few weeks? Count Me In is a series where we're talking about relationships, not uh, with your spouse, but I'm talking about, or a significant level, I'm talking about like a I'm talking about in community, in fellowship, in friendship, as the body of Christ, living in community, how we should treat one another. The scripture is very clear on how it should be laid out. And so uh, as you see, as we've been preaching through this, as you see for Central Campus, as you came in, you saw all those small group tables in the four years serve team opportunities. This is an opportunity for you to get connected in this fall. Also, next week is Back to Church Bash. Somebody say next week. At Central Campus, we're going to have rides, or uh, we're going to have stuff for the kids like petting zoos and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, it's going to be a fun day to kind of get back in that rhythm and routine of church and also back into community. Galatians chapter 6 is where we find ourselves today. The first five verses as we get started. Galatians chapter 6, starting at verse 1, says this. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin... You who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Verse 2, carry each other's burdens. Let me say that one more time. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. I want to preach to you the next few moments a message entitled, Bear With Me. Bear with me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for this opportunity to gather as the church. Thank you, Lord, for every first responder in our midst and watching online today, Lord, as 9-11, as we commemorate, as we remember where we were, what happened, the lives that were lost, and those who serve us on a daily basis, Lord, help us to honor them. And today, as we lean in and listen to your word today, as we lean in, God, would you illuminate it as only you can do. Give me the words to say, let it be a time of productivity and transformation in your presence. In Jesus' name. 
And all God's people said, look at your neighbor, slap them a high five on the way down and tell them, bear with me today, bear with me today. And you may be seated, amen, amen. Let's hear it for the worship team as we do every week. We appreciate, come on, what they do. Thank you, worship team, for leading us today. How many enjoy traveling by raising your hands? You guys like traveling? Any travelers out there? Yeah, I like traveling too. How many like experiencing new things and going places, trying something new? Yeah, I'm the same way. I love preparing for a trip. There's only just one challenge. The challenge is packing. Isn't that true? Come on, where are all my overpackers at? You know who you are. You just start stuffing stuff. You know what I mean? You just never know what you're going to run across into. And uh, I me, mean, I don't pack that way. Weston, hand me that small one right there. Hand me that small one. Come on up here. Thanks, buddy. Uh, I pack a little bit different than that. I'm not an overpacker. I travel light. Ain't my light travelers? I don't pack. If I'm going on a three-day trip, there ain't no sense in packing three pair of jeans. Let's be honest, people. A good pair of jeans start fitting just about day three. So I only take one pair of jeans. Just travel light. Do what you can to get through. The baggage is light. But some of y'all, man, you don't pack light. You, you pack your whole wardrobe just for a few-day trip. Hand me that big one. This is the way some of y'all travel. Come on. Nobody wants to bring me my prop, my illustration. Thank you. Some of y'all travel. Look, going on the same trip. Look how y'all pack. To Where are all my overpackers at? Because you never know in the middle of summer when it's going to snow, so I better pack a jacket. You know what I mean? Some flannels, some socks, some, some thermal underwear. You never know how it's going to be in Florida in August. So I better... I better pack, some of y'all overpack, got too much that you travel with. That's why at the airport, some of y'all are hard to deal with. I'm going to be honest with you. Because uh, when I go to the airport, I'm traveling light, y'all. I don't have a whole lot of baggage. But some of y'all come, I see some of y'all rolling your whole, your whole wardrobe down, going, and, and, and you, you go into the airport. Why is it that everybody is so unfriendly at the airport? Everybody looks mad, don't they? Nobody wants to talk to one another, and you go to the, to the part that I dread the most. You go through the security. Now, I don't mind security. I, I like the security part. The problem is the people in line because you got to come through, and your sense of anxiety level goes up when you're going through TSA and the exam the line. Uh, the, the, the reason why is not because they're checking all your ID. That, that part is great. I'm talking about when you are approaching the conveyor belt and everybody is staring at you. You know that? And you're fumbling for your belt and you're trying to undo your laces all at the same. You know what I'm talking about? Time to take out your electronics and everybody's got the eye roll looking at you. Will you come on? Will you hurry up? And I'm trying to sort through my stuff and get my cell phone out and, and, and put it all on the, on the conveyor belt. And I usually am looking at people like, uh, just bear with me. Just hold on. Be patient with me, people. Got a lot of stuff here. And you, you go through the thing and it beep, 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 beep. Excuse me, sir. You got to walk through again. Oh, that's right. I forgot change in my pocket. Put that aside. Bear with me. Be patient, people. With my baggage. Now the truth is today. That as we travel through life. All of us at some point end up with some sort of baggage along the way. Now, now some of the baggage is small. Some of it is big. It comes in all shapes or sizes. And we pick up our baggage. And we gather it and store it and stuff it along life's way. Now, 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 baggage comes from all different sources and all different places. Some of us picked up our baggage from some sort of childhood trauma or tragedy that we experienced in life, and now it has influenced the way we treat other people in relationships. Some of us, it's an emotional dysfunction that maybe was dealt to you by your family or, or maybe... It wasn't dealt to you by your family. Maybe you developed it yourself over time. Maybe, maybe your baggage came from a bad breakup back in college and you're still carrying it today. Maybe your baggage came from a devastating divorce that you went through and you experienced and you'll never be the same. And it's heavy what you are carrying the baggage in your life. 
Now, some of us have different types of baggage. Some of us are, are light. We don't carry a whole lot. And the reason why we don't have a lot of baggage is because we have learned to deal with it when we came to Christ and begin to conform to his word and saw a good counselor. We're able to unload and our baggage is a whole lot lighter. But then there are others of us, ladies and gentlemen, who your baggage is not light. Your baggage is a load. You have overpacked in life and you have been carrying uh, every stressor. You have been carrying every word that was ever said to you. You've been carrying some sort of offense for years unable to let it go so you lug it around and it becomes a, a heavy load so no matter how much you have all of us are carrying something whether it's light or it's a heavy load we all got baggage so the question is not do you have baggage the question is how much baggage are you carrying it is not are you crazy it's what kind of crazy are you? <laughs> and what we must realize is that what we are carrying can and will influence our relationships. And we must be people that are extremely aware and realize the baggage we bring so we can respond to the people we encounter with what we are carrying. Hey, listen, bear with me. Be patient with me, people, because I got a lot of baggage I'm carrying along the way. This is so powerful for you to realize and understand the clarity of what you are carrying. Because when you truly understand the baggage that you have and what you bring, it is imperative because that way, when you understand it, that way others and the perspective of the Holy Spirit working in your life can begin to unpack the baggage that you have been carrying for so long. Here's what I'm saying. We help each other out with the stuff that we are carrying. Are y'all hearing me today? This is the perspective I want you to see that Paul is writing about when we get to the book of Galatians. You see, when he is writing to the book of, uh, to, to the churches of Galatia, he is addressing a certain problem that has arose. And here is the problem. The problem is there was a certain sect within the church called the Judaizers. These people were an extreme faction within the church that always held to a high standard the religious uh, uh, Jewish law of the day, the, 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 the codes, the conducts, the traditions that they carried. And what they began to do is circulate a false gospel among the Gentiles about their salvation. And what they told them is this. That if you want to receive salvation, you not only have to believe in Jesus, but you also must also hold to the traditions and the teachings of the religious law, the Jewish law, and conduct of the day. And if you do not do both, then you, do, you are not saved. And this was a conflict within the church of the day between the Jews and the Gentiles who both love Jesus. So as this conflict arises, Paul writes the church and he confronts the issue and he tells them this in the book of Galatians. That all people, both Jews and Gentiles, are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone, that you are now set free from sin and the religious law and the conduct code of the Jewish law of the day. But here is the thing. Just because you have been set free does not mean you get to do whatever you want. That you are now in turn through your freedom to serve and love one another. Y'all follow me today. Anybody experience that freedom in your life that only Christ can bring? Amen? Amen. This is what Paul is getting at in his, in, his, in his teaching. And then we get up to uh, chapter 6 where Paul is beginning to bring it home. Chapter 6, once you got the context, now I want you to see where Paul goes. He says this in verse 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore, restore, restore him gently. 
Paul gives us this generic illustration and instruction of how to respond to someone who falls into sin. Now, let me ask you this question. Why would Paul just give us some sort of generic scenario of how to respond to someone who falls into sin? It's very clear. He's telling us that because of this. How you respond to someone who falls short reveals the true Christ-like character that is really inside of you. So although we would see it as a general statement or a scenario, suppose you run into somebody's sins. No, no, no. There is a deeper level that I want you to show you here. Because when he writes it, it is not a general scenario. He is speaking of the Judaizers who often responded to people in a different way than Paul is telling them to do. Because when it comes to someone falling into sin, the Judaizers would respond with condemnation as if they were people who did not have sin in their life and they are immune to falling themselves. So Paul is setting the record straight. He says this, suppose you find yourself in a scenario where someone sins. How you respond is this way. You respond by restoring Now, here's the good stuff. Y'all ready for the good stuff? That word restore, if you actually take that word restore and you study it, it is actually translated. The word restore, it is translated to mend or set back a broken bone. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about broken. Now, when we talk about broken bones, man... Look no further than the bunting household with five kids. We are all too familiar with broken bones. Matter of fact, as I preach right now, my son is on the front row with another, yet another, broken collarbone twice in one year playing football. We're going through it now. But the worst was even worse than him, going through two broken collarbones in less than one year. The worst was my son, Weston, who went probably through through the most traumatic experience of ever breaking a bone. Two years ago, he was about eight or nine years old, somewhere in that age, probably just turned nine. And uh, he's out on the slide, and nobody will say what happened, really. Somebody said, he was on, when he was on the slide, somebody said that he fell by himself. Others say, like him, he was pushed The culprit has still not yet been identified. Here we are two years later. But nonetheless, he is on a slide. He falls off. And my older son comes running in. Dad, Dad, Weston broke his arm. And I could hear Weston crying in the background. And so he comes in. And his arm looked like a U right in the middle of it. Y'all ever seen a broken arm before? And I'm like, "Mm, I can't. Oh. I can't do this. And Sarah goes into action all calm. It's going to be okay. And he's freaking out. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. So we go to the emergency room. And God bless every nurse in the emergency room. I don't know how you do it. So we go in. And the nurses are trying to calm him down. And he's saying, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. And they said, we got to because we have to set the bone back. In order for it to heal. They called the orthopedic and he, she came and she gave him some medicine. They reset his arm and put a splint on it. We go to orthopedic uh, doctor the following week. And as we come in, he's still screaming his head off in the office. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. It hurts. And they're like, I'm not even doing anything yet. And they told him surgery was not needed. It's going to sit back. So, so his arm was fine. We go by. Six months go by, people. He is out on a swing, not a slide. He jumps off the swing. His arms get caught up. He tries to brace himself as he falls. Same arm. Broken again, but it does not look like a U. It looks like a folded up accordion. I mean, it's like, I mean, just like a check mark. It was like, oh, I can't do this again. And he says, it happened again. I fell again. I fell again. Go right back to the emergency room. Don't touch it. 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 We got it. This time when the the orthopedics came, they said, we cannot set it back. We got to have surgery. So we went to the office that week and went through the 
the surgery, and I kid you not, we go to the secretary to check out. I, I, she looked at, I kid you not, this is the God's honest truth. She looked at him and said, you are such a brave boy. She said, several months ago, I was in here, and there was a kid screaming his head off. Don't touch it. Don't. <laughs> you are so brave. I was like, that was actually us. Same kid. <laughs> he had surgery. I don't want to do it. And the doctor says, I have to do this to set your arm back so it can heal properly so it can be used again. Here is the truth today. The truth is today, I don't care how long you have lived for the Lord or how long you have served Him. None of us is immune to or exempt from falling into sin. And whenever you fall into sin, that's when things begin to break. Because the consequences of sin is always broken. Broken relationships. Broken marriages. Broken self-esteem. Broken emotions. Broken, broken spirits. The deliberate disobedience because of sin always has devastating effects. And the effects are being broken. But this is what I want you to understand. When a sinful believer becomes broken because of the fall of sin... The whole body feels it. The Bible says that we are the body of Christ. So when one part suffers, we all suffer. When one part hurts, we all hurt. And just like a broken bone in the body, that when a sinful believe, when somebody sins who believes in Jesus, and they are broken, it needs to be repaired. It needs to be restored. It's got to be fixed. It's got to be set back. This is the response to us as a body of believers. That when someone falls in the body and is broken, we are here to help. Now it can be painful at times and it takes time to heal. But the truth is when somebody is broken... Our response is to set it back, it is to see it repaired, it is to see it restored. We cannot leave it how it is. Our response is always to fix and to set it back. Now that does not come through condemnation. Are y'all hearing me people? It does not come through condemnation. It comes through correction. It comes through accountability. It comes through encouragement. And over time, in time, what has been broken can be made whole again. It can be used again because the body gathers around the thing that is hurt, that is fallen, that is broken, and restores and repairs it right back to its rightful place again. Are y'all hearing me today? And then Paul continues on. Paul continues on with the rest of the verse. He says this, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Paul says, listen up. I want to be clear about this. He says that when someone uh, falls into sin, you got to be careful to make sure that they have a repentant heart because if they do not have a repentant heart, Instead of you restoring them, you will revert to where they are. Instead of you putting them back together again, they will pull you down in the depths of where they are. If their heart is not convicted and repentant and want to get back again and want to be set back to a better place. Y'all hear me today. This is the place of restoration of what God has called us to do, to do. Restore what is broken, and that's why Paul says in that back, it says in that verse, you should restore what has been broken, get it back again, but you got to make sure you set boundaries so you don't fall yourself. And then he says,
before we move on, I want to hit that one more time. To restore what is broken by setting boundaries. But let's be honest, though, can we today? Because of our baggage, some of us often respond to people the way the Judaizers did. We're just like the Judaizers in many, in many ways. Because sometimes we try to make ourselves look better by making them look worse. If I make them look bad, I'll make myself look good. And so I treat people a certain way where I bring condemnation. Where I don't bring restoration, I bring exploitation. I exploit them based off of what they did. So I get a better platform. I look better than everybody else. Listen, when somebody falls into sin, are y'all hearing me today? When somebody is repentant over sin, listen, you don't have to beat them up about it because the conviction power of the Holy Spirit is good enough to do it. Are y'all following me? God has called us, are you ready? God has called us to be a splint, not a splinter. To be something that is helpful to restore people and make them whole again, not someone who continues to dig in because it makes you feel better about yourself. That's what the Judaizers did. Did you know in John chapter 8, they brought condemnation upon a woman who got caught in the act of adultery? She got caught in sin. And you know what their response is? Condemnation to look down on her enough to drag her out in front of Jesus because the religious law said she should be stoned to death. But did you notice Jesus' response? He did not respond to her with the same condemnation that they brought. He responds totally different. Jesus looked at them and said, if you've got no sin, then go ahead and cast the first stone. And Jesus bent down in the ground and wrote something. Many theories are that Jesus was writing their own sins that nobody else knew about in the dirt. And one by one, they dropped the rock and they walked away. Jesus is saying that we all have the opportunity to fall into sin. We're not here to break each other down. We're here to build each other back up and to restore one another. That's what the body of Christ is all about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as if, as if you are doing. That is what God has called us to do. But then my favorite part of the verse, when he continues on, the favorite part of this section of scripture happens in verse 2. He says this. He says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, I love what the King James Version says. It says in verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We are called to carry each other's burdens or bear with one another's burdens. That's the second thing. I want to talk to you about the burden. Now, you may not see it on the surface today by what you see in front of you. But if you could get beneath the surface of people, you would see some of y'all in this room and watching online, you're carrying some heavy burdens. And by burden, I mean weight. By burden, I mean pressure. By burden, I mean problem or situation or difficulty that just sits on the inside of you. And if you would be truthful today, you, you would admit that some of y'all are carrying some heavy stuff that you're facing. Some of you are, you're burdened today. You're burdened today by a kid who is strung out on drugs. And every time the phone rings, you don't know what's going to be on the other end. And it's become a burden to you. It's a weight. It's a pressure. 
because you don't know how it's going to turn out for others of you. you you're carrying a, bur a heavy burden of a, um, an uncertain financial future. The paycheck comes in and it goes right back out again. You've paid the bills, but you don't know how you're going to make it next month. And it becomes a heavy weight that you're carrying a burden every month that sits in your soul. Maybe you're like me today and you're burdened being a parent with young kids. Because if you got young kids or you got teenagers today, you know that times have changed when you were a kid. There's a brand new facet out there that you can't even comprehend until you start having teenage kids, man. And it is crazy. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm burdened by it. I trust my kids. I love my kids. I teach my kids. My kids ain't the problem. It's the other kids that they come in contact with that create influences that could create a path in life that you never taught them, but yet they follow others' leads, and it can be heavy or burdensome. Maybe, maybe some of you, you're burdened by a, by a spouse that has created distance, and you don't know what's going on, and it's heavy inside of you. This burden you are carrying can be so heavy at times, you almost feel like you're about ready to collapse. So heavy and so burdensome. You feel like you're going to bend and you're going to break. Because I don't know how I can take much more with what's heavy. And what Paul is communicating is at the core of a Christ-like community is this. We carry each other's burdens. This, my friends, is the beauty of the church, is that we bear each other's burdens. Why? Are you ready for the why? Because it is too heavy to carry yourself. It is too big of a burden for you to do it alone. You know, when I think about 9-11, I think about those airplanes that flew into the tower. Did you know? Here's, here's a fact for you. Some of you already know this. But what brought the towers down wasn't the planes themselves. But the planes were filled with fuel. So when they crashed into the tower and it exploded, it ignited all the fuel inside. The fire was so fierce and so hot it began to compromise the infrastructure, the metal, the support system inside of the building to the point where it could no longer carry the load or the weight of the building until it all came crashing down. Can I propose to you today that something is compromised Something is cracked. Something cannot support the weight of what is heavy inside of your light. And I'm going to tell you why it is so heavy and why you feel like you're going to collapse. You know what it is? It's the support system. It's the infrastructure of your faith. Now, it didn't always used to be that way. Pre-COVID... Many of you had strong support systems, either by serving or small groups or coming to church. There was a, a community of believers where you felt like when we were together, I had someone there with me and, and we could carry this burden together. But something broke in COVID. And I know we're a couple of years removed. I'm going to tell you what broke. Because when the crowd returned, community did not. And now more than ever, we are inconsistent, even with coming to church. Whereas before, 
We wouldn't miss a whole lot, but now it's like, eh, I'll catch it on the treadmill. A lack of connection to things that help me carry things. And I'm going to tell you who's suffering. Our kids are suffering. Mental health and suicide rates in young kids and teenagers is through the roof. Marriages are falling apart. People with mental health concerns, it's, it's, it's crazy right now. I'm going to tell you why it's crazy is because we are carrying things on our own that we were never meant to carry by ourselves. And we can't see that the infrastructure of our faith, the support systems have been weakened and can no longer carry the load. That is why we feel like we're about ready to crash down. You have to begin in your life to connect with people who can help you carry things that you cannot carry yourself. Which leads me to ask the question today. Who is helping you carry things that are heavy? Who's helping you carry the load? Some of us got to get back to a point where we say this. We would get back in community and we would tell other people, bear with me. Bear this with me. I can't carry this thing by myself. It is too much of a heavy load. I'm going to come crashing down if I don't have brothers and sisters that collect around me and help me carry me. In the, it's too big. It's too heavy. I cannot do it by myself. Now, I wish this is something this morning. I'm just going to be, can I just have an honest, transparent moment with you and tell you that not many people know. I wish I could be up here and say I was perfect at this all the time. And when I preach it, I always lived it out. But that isn't the truth. In all honesty, this morning in 2019, I found myself coming crashing down in a counselor's room. Because I had reached the end of myself. I had reached the point as your pastor where the church exponentially was growing up to 2019. And so many people were coming. And God was doing such an amazing work. But I took on the responsibility by myself to bear everybody's burden and to help everybody else. But I was not in a, in a transparent state of mind to let others help me. And sometimes when you become a leader, it is extremely difficult to let others help you because you're always helping somebody else. And so all I did was give of my time and my efforts, and all I did was pour out. But I came to a point where I just came crashing down. I couldn't understand what was wrong with me. I would cry and have panic attacks, and I couldn't understand what is wrong with me. Everything is great in life. I have beautiful kids. I have a beautiful wife. I have a great family. I pastor the best church in the world. Why would I feel this way? I had reached a point of burnout. Because I didn't let anybody bear anything with me. I just carried it all myself. Until the point where I found myself in a counselor's office because my wife looked at me one day and said, this is not the man I married. You can't keep going like this. And I sat in front of a counselor in 2019 and I said, maybe I just need to quit. Maybe I just need to go do something else. I don't know. And he looked at me and he said, you know what's funny is <laughs> you're not the only pastor I've ever heard say that. If you're ever going to beat burnout, you've got to have people that you can bear your burdens to. <laughs> where you can receive help yourself. 
And I began a process of putting people around me that keep me accountable, that I can talk to, where I am no longer carrying the burdens by myself. And because of that, it put me in one of the best positions and places I've been in in a long time, people. And the reason why I want to tell you that story today is this. The reason why I want to tell you that is because some of you don't want others to carry your burden. You want, you're the fixer, you're the pleaser, you're the helper. And so you think you can hold it because you can hold heavy things on your shoulder. I'm going to tell you, you might be strong, but you're not that strong. And it is only a matter of time before you come crashing down. We've got to carry each other's Man, I feel the Holy Spirit in this room right now. And Paul begins to finish. Man, I wish I had time to keep going. But Paul finishes in verse 5. He says this. In verse 5. In verse 5. Go to verse 5. Skip verse 3 and go to verse (laughs) 5. Keep going. Keep going. There we go. For each one should carry his own loan. Now, wait a second there. This is confusing. There seems to be a contradiction, didn't it? Verse 2, he says, carry each other's burdens. Then verse 5, he says, carry your own loads. Seems like a contradiction, but it's not. Because of the Greek translations of the words, carry each other's burdens translated means weight or pressure. Carry your own load is translated, watch this, a soldier's pack. Now, I don't know if you've been in the military at all, but here's one thing I do know, even though I've never been in the military. I guarantee you when you're on a long hike or a march and you don't feel like carrying your pack anymore, you can't place it on someone else and let them carry the load the rest of the way. Is that true? I don't know. Right? Right? Why? Your brothers and sisters around you will help you, but you have a personal responsibility to carry what is your obligation. That's the last thing I want to give you before we leave here. I want to talk to you about the obligation. We are called to bear with one another, bear our burdens with one another. But at the same time, you have a personal responsibility to carry a load that's been put on you. The problem with some of us is this. The problem with some of us is we want to cast it on other people's and, ne- and never carry it ourselves. We want to put that weight and that burden on others so we don't have to feel it at all. But there is a personal obligation and a pressure that you've got to carry in your life. Jesus said, pick up your cross, take up your cross, and follow me daily. So we bear one another's burdens, but at the same time, I have an obligation to carry what God has put on me or what life has put on me that when I'm going through this life, I have people to rely on, but I also have a responsibility to walk this thing out. If you believe that word today, would you stand to your feet? Now, this is a different type of way of closing today. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to all of our campus pastors, campus directors at every location that the Holy Spirit would give you what you need to close out today. Come on, let's hear it for them now. Thank you so much for joining us online at Emmanuel Church today. My hope is that this time of worship, word, and community has been an encouragement to you and your faith journey. Maybe you decided to accept Christ for the first time, rededicate your life to Christ, or maybe you just have questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ or about who Jesus was during his time here on earth and who he can be in your life today. So if any of that is you, I encourage you to text the message E-Decision to the number 77411 so someone from our team can reach out to you, we can celebrate with you, we can answer any questions you may have, and most importantly, we can pray with you and begin to walk alongside you in your faith journey today. Well, thanks again for joining us online at Emmanuel Church. I hope you have a great week.